Howdy, folks. Welcome to a special episode of the InsureTech Geek Podcast. Today, we'll be doing a unique episode centered around the insights, technologies, and new perspectives on insurance that we learned on this podcast over the past year. The InsureTech Geek Podcast, powered by JB Knowledge, is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. We'll be interviewing guests and doing deep dives into specific tech we see changing the industry. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech, so enjoy the ride and geek out. This episode of the Insure Tech Geek Podcast is brought to you by Terra. Visit Terra.insure, that's T-E-R-R-A dot insure, to discover how Terra is changing insurance claims and policy management. We're here to have a conversation about what 2023 meant for our industry, the biggest innovations we got to see and talk about, and how the industry is changing its biggest challenges heading into 2024 and more. I'm your host, James Benham. I'm joined by my co-host, the most interesting man in insurance, Rob Galbraith, San Antonio, Texas, College Station, Texas. It's a, a Texas uh, team here getting this done. Uh, super excited. Uh, Merry Christmas and uh, and happy early new year, Rob. Yeah, likewise, man. Uh, thanks, James. I mean, it's been kind of a wild ride we were just talking like before we started hitting record you know it's been been three years it's great to be here great to share the experiences with the listeners and um yeah i mean once again uh, a huge year for insure tech yeah also a year in which we dropped the e i, I just want to you know the most <laughs> notable thing for our podcast uh we went from insuring into the audience insure in. tech uh <laughs> to insure tech uh we dropped the e uh off of uh, off of insure tech <laughs> When we first started this, of course, we were, we were keying off of InsureTech Connect, even though they just call as ITC now. Uh, everybody else calls InsureTech. So that was a little minor change, change domain name, change podcast name. But there's a lot more than that. That was like a little superficial scratch compared to everything else that happened this year. Um, we had some really, really, really great episodes. We had some really, really great guests. We had a lot of really great listeners. And it was definitely a year when I, I got a lot of comments from people saying, hey, listen to this episode, listen to this episode. They would talk about stuff they listened to on the show. Um, we, uh, we, we had a, a lot of really great folks in the insurance space, like insurance executives. Uh, we, you know, we had some, some, some great insure techs, but a lot of folks that are execs in the insurance business as well. Um, really, really neat. If you go all the way back, we started the year out back in January. Um, we had, uh, Alex Bond, you know, and Jay uh, Barto of Zeitworks and Alex Bond from FinPro. Then we went on to Caribou Honig, who he's with, uh, Semperverans Venture Capital, right? And he was actually one of the, um, one of the founders of ITC. Uh, then we went to Roberto Sacconi from Dreyev. We, um, had some good conversations with Roy Mill from Joshu. We, uh, discussed commercialization with Steve Miller. Then we, we went on through, you know, the second quarter, was like Brent Hammer um, with uh, Grange Insurance and then Nikki Corey from Prudential and then Lars Gehrman from from uh, Cutter Insurance. I actually got to circle back with Lars uh, this past week and had a great follow-up with him. He had a really cool uh, conference there in Cutter for Insurance and InsureTech that I'm really looking forward to hopefully going to this, this coming year. Uh, I was excited about. We also had a really great conversation with uh, Jeff Shee, Sean Davis, and Ira Ziff. That was actually a little brainchild of Jeff, who's been just a high energy, amazing person to be connected with. Um, then we had, uh, you know, the uh, Stacy Brown from InsureTech Hartford and Harry Stort from Protective Insurance, Rose Hall from AXA, and then just kind of closing the year out, ended up with uh, Karan Misha from e EY, um, you know, and Daniel Wyman and. And Gina Torres, uh, we had Sasha Sanyal from Microsoft, uh, you know, Chris Rhodes from the, the uh, came on as well. Um, then down to Jake Tamarkin from Everyday Life. Uh, I'm in Rajan from AMAX. And then we kind of closed the year out uh, with, uh, with the Insurance Council of Texas, Albert Betts. We had a great conversation about the Texas insurance market. Teresa Blissing came on, had a great conversation about Asia and this role in insure tech. And then down to Dennis Lee with Amplify Life and Lisa Wardlog, very good friend of ours, another InsureTech thought leader with 360 Digital Immersion. And uh, the most recent podcast that's live, um, we ha had Greg Hamlin on from Berkeley Industrial. So it was a really good conversation. We got another episode coming up, by the way, with the, the insurance commissioner of Nevada, yeah. like, which, was, which was really exciting um, to have a great conversation on, on that. It was great. So, I mean, I would say, like, if I look back at the year, 
we had conversations with people from all over the insurance space, whether it was insure tech or insurance or work comp or property, auto, GL, different lines. We had life and health. We had people from all over the world that talked about insure tech in Asia and insure tech in Qatar and insure tech uh, in Europe. We had a European insure tech conversation. We, it was that, that's, and, and obviously down to our own country, Texas. No, I'm just kidding. It really would be <laughs> place, so that was kind of like, for, for me, the exciting was like, before we jump into our questions, Rob, was the, the breadth and depth of geographical reach of people that we had that were really excited about insure tech. And then also like lines, you know, lines of business and the different flavors of insurance. Don't you think? Yeah, I think it was a great year for the podcast. And I mean, um, you know, I actually kind of credit you, James, because when we started out, right, our focus was a lot on the st startups that were you know, kind of shaking up the industry, you know, new to insurance. We wanted to make people aware of them. Uh, oftentimes they're leveraging, right? Newer technologies, emerging technologies is kind of the term I use, right? Whether that's AI or GPS or cloud or, you know, whatever it is, right? Or maybe they're actually competing and they're selling their MGA or whatever, right? And so for the first couple of years, we really focused on that. And, you know, you kind of had this insight of you wanted to actually go broader, right? And you wanted to focus on where's change happening in the industry, no matter where, right? So it could be carriers, it could be consultants, it could be technologists, it could be thought leaders. And so hopefully our audience kind of saw that, longtime listeners, right? And, and viewers kind of saw that this year that we've really kind of expanded, I would say the mix of guests that you're getting and you're getting you know, some of the more senior officials. And like you said, now even the regulator we're adding to the mix. So I just think it's been an exciting year for the, the podcast. And I think we're maturing maybe as the insure tech movement is maturing as well. Absolutely. It really is. I mean, the whole movement's really getting, you know, uh, a lot of the uh, hype cycle has flushed out, right? And so we're getting down to the meat and bones of what actually is uh, able to deliver returns back to policyholders and returns to shareholders of insurance companies, right? Because those are the two areas that you really look for is like, how can the, how can the shareholders of insurance companies win? Um, how can the policyholders win? Like you want both parties to win. Uh, and you want technology to drive better results for both of them. We don't want either to, to win at the expense of the other. And so that's, uh, that also involves, you know, eliminating a lot of waste out of the industry, which is really, really uh, what a lot of our topics center around is how to cut out waste, right. And deliver a more efficient, effective product. So let's jump right in. Um, after discussing how innovation needs to move fast in an industry famous for resisting change, through all these episodes I just mentioned, we encountered a lot of great stories, company, companies, and interesting individuals. Uh, who do you, a like, team or company or individual, consider to be the biggest disruptors in InsureTech this year? Yeah, I think uh, it'll be this year and it may be kind of lasting. It, it probably was, you know, previous years and, and definitely going forward. And I'd have to point out to Microsoft in our conversation with Sasha Sanyal because, you know, uh, obviously, a ton of insurance firms have a relationship with Microsoft. They've used the Office Suite for years, right? Uh, they probably have Exchange for their email. And, you know, I really think even, you know, reflecting back on some of the conversations that I had just a, a, a while ago that Azure, right? And kind of that made the move to the cloud, I think, kind of a more of a, a normative thing. It wasn't cutting edge. So I know folks like Google Cloud were out there, AWS were kind of maybe out there sooner and people kept hearing about the benefits of the cloud. But I think because of that pre-existing relationship with Microsoft, you know, it, it was standing up Azure and, and companies felt it's kind of safe, I guess, right? In that Microsoft embrace, I guess I would say, to kind of migrate to the cloud and all the benefits that come with that. And then of course, right, you've got the the open AI relationship and obviously we're just coming off. So there's, there's probably a recency bias in my mind on this, but right, just this kind of like, you know, <laughs> the CEO leaves and is installed back in and such as like, okay, we didn't have board representation, at least we're gonna have a board observer now. We're gonna be a little more active and whatnot. So, you know, just think about that strategic relationship and partnership and obviously generative AI probably being the buzz word or, or phrase or technology of the year. And so, you know, probably more buzz, I would say, than than actual application um, this year. But I definitely think going forward, that's going to be a revolutionary technology, particularly for the insurance industry. We have so much unstructured data, right? We're not, we're not uh, lacking for data in the industry. We're lacking for insights. We're lacking to make sense of it. So I would kind of point them out. I'd kind of reflect back to you, James. What about you? What do you think is kind of the most impactful, you know, trend or company or disruptor from this? Well, I think that... Um to 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 um, parry off of the uh, comment you just made, I think the biggest technology 
that got the entire population excited and that got the entire business community excited and that raced to 100 million users faster than any technology or tool in human history, ChatGPT, unlocked a lot of people's brains as to what's actually possible with large language models, which are a specific subset of AI that was really not on the general population's radar before now. They were looking at machine learning models, maybe, if they even knew what that was. They, you know, really viewed this as a voice assistance like Alexa, Siri, Google. But once they released to the public and raced to hundreds of millions of users and delivered something that has real practical value on a day to day basis and became a staple, like it's, you know, it's a big deal when it becomes an icon on the home screen of your phone. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, it's it's on the home screen of my phone. Um, and I think that's a that's a big deal for me. By the way, the other app that just made its way onto my home screen of my phone, you know, the the um, uh, master class this year. <laughs> that sounds oh, nice. crazy. Like I got I got I got super I got super into master class. Um, and but I I I think that that chat GPT and LLMs in general, cause it's not the only large language model, right? I mean, we've got, I started using Grok. Um, now mind you, Elon Musk is a major investor in chat GPT. It, it gets complicated because open AI was a consortium of a lot of folks and Microsoft has, has a heavy hand, but uh, you know, Grok uses real time data from Twitter. And I, I've, I have found that the, that real time mix is, is a big deal. But again, back to InsureTech, I think that unlocked a lot of people's mind in InsureTech as to what's pop- possible by feeding um, private LLMs, not public LLMs with, you know, sensitive data uh, and then starting to ask questions. Because like you said, we're not we're not lacking data. We're lacking insights. We got a ton of free text, tons, tons of free text. And you saw some really cool tools come out this past year that summarize medical records for work comp claims or for like any claim, by the way. I mean, like wise docs is super cool and it, it goes through and deduplicates and summarizes medical records. Like that's really freaking cool. Uh, and it saves a ton of time and you, you can do the same thing with, with, you know, diaries and, and claim notes uh, is, is providing for a summarization. It's huge. I, I, re, I fed, I fed chat GPT seven RFPs the other day and had it summarize all the requirements that were common to all seven. And it did the work in under a minute. That's awesome. <laughs> well, that that's really, that's really helpful. <laughs> I mean, it's, oh, it's we're taking hours. You had to do manually, right? You it was taking hours to do that manually. Job either. Yeah. And it's, and it's really super helpful, super useful. So I, I think that's, um, that that's something that's really unlocking a lot of brains, but the reality is it's not in production in a lot of places. Right you know, embedded in applications. And so, you know, what, what change, what moved the needle in production for insurance companies? Well, a lot of cloud migrations. I agree. Azure, it was a major year for Azure migrations. It was a major year for porting applications to the cloud and starting to actually leverage Azure, Azure cognitive services and OCR and all the things that are baked into that. So I, I'd say outside of large language models, just Azure cognitive services in general and Azure, I would totally agree with you. And, you know, from our, from our client base, because we work for carriers, TPAs, uh, brokers, we do custom software and we have our own off the shelf product. Th- those were major innovations this year um, that that have been around, but really commercialized well this year. Um, so I think that's that was probably mine. Um, you know, we could fill a book or both of our books. So we both had books. Uh, you know, I, I released mine a year ago. You released yours a little bit longer than that ago. Um, yours, End of Insurance, as we know it. Mine, Be Your Own VC. Um, we could fill a book with all the challenges that our guests brought about in our discussions about the industry. So what would you say is the most common challenge our guests talked about? Yeah, I was trying to think, I mean, I think uh, a couple things. Um, number one, I would say um, just automation, streamlining, right? There's a lot of expenses, unfortunately. Um, so you look at expense ratios and costs of different product lines. Obviously it varies. Auto is going to be less than a work comp say, or, you know, long uh, tail liability lines, et cetera. But 
everyone's got mundane processes, right? We've talked about like broker submissions and, and, and claims handling and, you know, the underwriting process and things like that. So there's a lot of back office stuff that, you know, uh, client facing folks like never, or the clients never see, right. But yet they're driving up costs and inefficiency and it's not necessarily improving the customer service. And I think we're in this weird time where you can actually save money, you know, streamline your processes and provide a better customer service. Like normally you have to pick a trade off there, right? Well, if I want to bet, have best better customer service i gotta you know have a higher price point right no i can have bare bones right it could be the southwest airlines no first class no meals etc right a lower price point but not as good customer service and we're in this very you know unique kind of time of, of sweet spot where you can actually do both you can it, it, it reduce expenses and improve the customer experience at the same time so you know i think just different people uh, different uh, places along that journey, but that was kind of a recurring theme that I heard people. Two other ones, obviously, like you know, with interest rates, funding, profitability. That's why Be Your Own VC was kind of released at the perfect time, James. So, congratulations <laughs> on a year, and congratulations on hitting the the market exactly right. The Fed's <laughs> jacking up interest rates to high heaven, and now you know everyone's pulling back from a from a funding landscape. And then talent, right? You kind of mentioned folks like you know Alice Vaughn. Bon Alex Bond and the conversation we had with Jeff and, and Ira and folks like that is something that it was kind of like, and I get a lot of questions about that and I'm not a recruiter, I'm not in that space, but yet, you know, I know that that's something that just a ton of people are really focused on, right? It's like, how do I upskill the people that I have, how to replace the talent that's walking out the door that's retiring? How do I keep young people in what's traditionally been an apprenticeship type model, but guess what? They don't want to sit there and be like an underwriting assistant for five years before they can actually have their own book, right? Or, or producer, or et cetera, et cetera. And so how do I deal with this constant change where we're really getting away from that kind of lifetime employment model within the industry? Um, so I know, and I, I, you mentioned Albert Betts. I know that's something that he's been very focused on with uh, the members that he has. Yeah, it has. It has. Absolutely. I mean, the Insurance Council of Texas is very concerned about uh, recruiting of the future generation of, uh, of people into the industry as well, right? And uh, they were actually at, on campus at the, uh, the university. I'm on the board of Regents of Texas Southern University, and they were there talking and recruiting people and providing um, some really great resources for them. Um, so I was really excited about that. And it's, uh, I, I think, you know, long term what we need for, for the insurance business um, is – a um a set of really strong university programs around insurance because i think that would that would really because if you have university programs where professors are focused on insurance they'll do research as we're on insurance as well and and they can produce really high quality research that the that the industry can then consume so there's i think there's a, a lot a lot there uh on the table that uh that can improve uh for sure i think that would be a big deal um what what about like what about like a tool or assortment of tools you think the whole industry should keep an eye on to face some of those challenges? Like we've, we talked about, you know, chat GPT and open AI. We talked about Azure. And of course this, the set of tools in Azure is huge, enormous, massive, like the set of things you can leverage for image recognition and text and even text summarization. That's actually a feature in cognitive services is a summarized feature that does text summarization on large documents. So, you know, you could definitely argue you've already answered this by saying Azure because cognitive services is a massive set of tools to enable a lot of this change. But what does anything else come to mind for you? Uh, so I'm going to share my thoughts, but I, I want to turn this question back on you because I know you've emphasized the importance of like creative, uh, creating digital ecosystems and insurance. And, and so you've got your pulse on this probably even closer than I do in terms of what you do, right, from a technology standpoint and the clients that you serve. But, you know, to me, it's all about kind of flexibility and agility and people have been struggling with that. So they, they you know, kind of upgraded from their old, you know tech debt, right? Legacy systems. And they've moved to like the Guidewire or Duck Creeks, right? Or some of these other systems with Jesco's. And so that's that digital transformation has been really all about what the 2010s were about. And obviously some people are, are still on that journey. Um, and then other people have been trying to like automate through like RPAs and stuff like that. But then they recognize, you know, and I had this problem too, where it's like, oh, guess what? The Secretary of State's office changed their look at their websites, our RPA breaks, right? Now we got to reconfigure and all that. So you know, I've been hearing a lot over the past two, three years about kind of low code, no code platforms and, you know, kind of almost like a lightweight, right? Policy admin system or things like that. Maybe I, I have some product innovation I want to launch. I don't want to do a full guidewire implementation. I just want to see if this is a thing or not, right? And I want to build up a little, you know, carrier portal or I want to have a little, you know, claim system or billing system, whatever, and kind of see. And if I need to migrate it later on, if it takes off, then great. But so that kind of 
there's been a gap, I think, in that kind of like lightweight, you know, flexible, easy to modify, easy to stand up, easy to modify kind of system that I think a lot of insurers have been kind of looking for to, to bring true innovation to the marketplace. So that's what I would say, but I'm curious your thoughts on that uh, subject in general, and then particularly low code, no code platforms, if they're worth the squeeze or not. Yeah, I don't know if they're worth a squeeze or not, you know, the because I think the, the jury's still out on that. Um, look, you, you, yeah, this is, saying low code, no code is like, um, it's like, uh, it's like saying something's powered by AI. Like a lot of times you pull the, uh, you pull the, 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 the hood up and you look at it and you go, oh, it's the same thing we've always had. It's just a bunch of if then conditional statements. So it was like, we first had chat bots hit the insurance market and I went and tested some of the chat bots out and I was like, this is literally the same ANSI text terminal interface I coded when 1992 on MS DOS, like you literally just created a text interface where people select numbers. That's not a chat bot, you know? So that's, that's challenging. Whereas like what I do with chat GPT every day, that's a chat. Bot. <laughs> like I, I can have full sentence conversations with it and it knows how to interpret what I'm saying. That's more along the line. When you go to low code, no code, it, this, this actually ties back to an episode. And unfortunately I don't remember which one it was. Because I was racking my brain about this earlier. And it was an episode where one of our insurance carrier um, guests was talking about how they stand up new lines of business. And they said that in their in their company, they don't they don't let them stand up a new line of business on their core platforms. They make them do the underwriting and uh, and and policy issuance in Excel and Word until it gets to a certain threshold. Yeah. And maybe, I, think, I want to say it was 50 million or 100 million in premium, some large number. You know, it was like a major number because what they found is when they let everybody say, look, we want to chase after this line of business, they would spend an incredible amount of time and effort baking and building and deploying that line of business into their core platform. And it would just wouldn't hit. They wouldn't be able to write the business. And they found that they could actually uh, they could actually underwrite and issue policies in Word and Excel, which you can do. Look, you can do that. You can do on small volume. You, you can absolutely underwrite and do policy issuance on Word and Excel. And uh, I mean, carriers do it all day long, every day. And so they say, look, once you hit a certain threshold on premium, then we'll go ahead and put the project in to bake it into our platform. And I thought, man, what a great approach to forcing an underwriting team and, you know, forcing a business development group to, to really put up or shut up, you know, like show results, go out and sell this. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll build the systems to support you later so that, you know, so we can scale it, but to prove the concept, I thought it was great for lightweight proof of concept. Certainly the promise of low code, no code is that you, without hiring a lot of software developers now in a low code platform, Honestly, you end up still writing a lot of code. You're just writing a lot of code in a platform that already has a bunch of intrinsic built-in features. And, and I'm not going to name specific names, but there's platforms out there that give you <clears throat> a new scripting language that's usually based on JavaScript that requires that you configure your system. Well, when you at the end of the day, you're still hiring devs to 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 code this. You're just coding it. It's just like, and honestly, like Guidewire, Gosu is their own version of Java. They did that, what, 20 years ago. I mean, they, they literally rolled out their own version of Java that you have to configure their system with, and then you compile Guidewire. So this that's that's not a real new topic. I mean, Salesforce has eight, has, um, uh, geez, their Trailblazer learning plat platform will certify you in their own scripting coding language. But it's all based on JavaScript. And so you still have to code, right? You still you still have teams, you still have deployments, you still have deployment schedules. So like, I don't know. I, I think sometimes a purpose built um, policy and claim system that that you know is configurable. You you could argue that configurable and no code are very similar, right? You can configure a new line of business and set it up without having to, to script and write code. So it's that that's that, that's the deal. Like in, in Salesforce, you're going to write Apex code in Guidewire. You're going to write Gosu, you know, and then, then you, then you go to some of the newer low code platforms. They've created a new scripting language 
based on JavaScript that you have to compile. And I, I, so it that that's why I, I question whether you know, I think you're still going to be coding. It's just how 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 many lines of code you write are way less, and that's really what it comes down to. Like it's just way less. You know, when we do Apex work in Salesforce for insurance companies, it takes way less time than if we if we had to build all the core intrinsic features from the ground up because with Salesforce, you get all their core baked in feature functionality that you can just reference as an object. And so I, I think that's the the big time saver on deployment is that you don't have to code all of these concepts from scratch like you would if you were writing it in .NET. And so um, that being said, you still have to have engineers, you still have deployment cycles, still got to build things. Yeah, I think that's the resource, right? Where's, where's the bottleneck, right? And so is the bottleneck, right? Prioritization, we don't have enough you know, engineers, right. We don't have enough, like, um, and obviously folks have gone for like, you know, waterfall agile to help save that. But I mean, I think that's where you know, the promise of no code of, Oh, your product manager, you know, can just drag and drop on their own. They don't have to engage, right. Anybody on it, they don't have to get prioritized. They don't have to write stories or whatever. Right. Um, but to your point, it's like, you know, I don't know how far you can go without involving somebody with some technical knowledge that actually knows what the heck they're doing. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's like you, you don't necessarily get away from IT groups and coders. They just code in different things that make it faster to deploy. We write probably 70% less code to, de to deploy something today than 20 years ago. Because there's a lot of stuff that's built in. You want to, you want a table that search, sort, filter, export, drag. In 2001, when I started this company, in my dorm room, I had to hand code all that. I had to hand code all the feature functionality is search, sort, filter, export, now it, I drop one object in and it's done. Drop an object, feed it a list, and I have all that functionality. Okay, that's that's pretty helpful, right? That that, that accelerates our our timetables for delivering code. We'll see. We'll see. So let's let's move on. Um, this this is a this is something that I I it's almost like our hot list of of uh insure tech uh, in influencers <laughs> and this is actually what i want to uh what what this is my, my last question for you we've entered we've interviewed some of the really super interesting people during the year as the most interesting man in insurance <laughs> who do you think is bringing about the biggest changes or highlight to the industry uh, it could be insurers themselves thought leaders ceos uh is it a team effort um you know like wh wh who, who do you think the big movers are that are actually having an impact in the, in the space. And it could be a company, it could be an individual, it could be a team. Yeah. I think it's changed over time. You know, I think when we kind of started, you know, and again, debate, right. You know, early 2010s, mid 2010, when do we want to call the beginning of the insure tech era? Right. Um, kind of followed FinTech by right? two, three years, whatever. So wherever you demark that, I, I think the beginning I would say was very much driven by outsiders and that could be technologists, right. Entrepreneurs, you know, that's what I, I tell the story in my book of like, hey, I went to my CPC underwriting conference every year in 2015. It was the first time I actually met somebody from Silicon Valley. Now, I'd got been to Silicon Valley. I had went to high school that worked for companies here or whatever, but it was almost like that was our world and that was an insurance world and the two didn't mix at all, right? And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, you don't know anything about underwriting. Why are you here? It's like, well, I want to learn just enough to put all you guys out of business. Like, oh, wow, you know, this, this guy's kind of arrogant and full of himself. <laughs> like, and that used to our congenial, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, insurance. And I had people like an insure tech connect you know, we're outsiders that said oh, we love working in insurance because you guys are so friendly whereas other industries would disrupt everyone you know hates us or whatever right <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's interesting out. so i do think at the beginning right for the first five years or so it was driven by you know outsiders right and even you know folks like deloitte and other like outside right consulting firms were kind of seeing this right i think that's changed and i think it's driven by a lot of the individuals within the insurance industry now and so i would say there's really kind of three categories of of like roles that i see so the first is i would just say uh, usually a division head right or president so the chief claims officer chief underwriting officer and they're probably the biggest mover because they have people they have needs they have limitations so you know they're, they're hearing it from their leadership team of like you know here's what we're not able to do plus they're getting like you know messages from the ceo and others of like hey we need to move faster we need to be able to do have this capability etc so they're really where the rubber hits the road they have the purse strings and i think they can really drive a lot of you know innovation within their organization so i would say it's kind of at that you know division head level or or, or you know again chief underwriter chief actuary etc the second group i would say is is probably um 
you know, the CEOs themselves, um, they probably have a, a more long-term view and a more outsider type view. They probably, you know, have access to, you know, whether it's a CEO council, whether it's a, a you know, consulting firm or whatever, right? Like they're probably getting exposed. So they're probably thinking a little bit longer term. I, I just think like where the rubber hits the road sometimes, like there's more immediate needs. And so that gets more attention. But yep. I do think yep. CEOs are kind of driving it. And then the third thing that I don't think is, is as much now, but may in the future is, is again, right. That outside, you know, startups, uh, you know, VCs, et cetera, but the competition isn't there. And so I do think when there's a threat from the outside to your industry, whether it's like you need to right, move fast or you need to get out of the way, um, that fuels us as an industry. And I think that was there for a time and that's kind of waned a little bit, right. With seeing folks like lemonade, for instance, right. Kind of having some harder times hippo like i said we've moved to profitability some of these other more kind of you know gen oh i know that uh, companies. The, the the uh yeah the ever elusive profitability metric yeah so i think though that, that that that's gone away but that is there right and so when you feel that competitive threat and i think right you know i see with my dog right she sees another dog in the neighborhood all the hair gets up on her back right she might attack <laughs> she might not but at least the hair is up right and i think for a time those companies really kind of helped our insurance firms get their hair up and the hair has now started to mat back down a little bit. But I do think that that, you know, fear of missing out or fear of falling behind or, or, you know, that, that competition can be healthy in the long run in terms of driving innovation. Yeah. I, I think in that, in that space, it's kind of similarly like that when, as, as I've got, I got to, I got to go to four different Reuters insurance conferences and talk with just dozens of executives on stage, dozens. It was great to just have that many you get to facilitate that many roundtable discussions, but it's a lot harder for me to tell the difference between a tech, um, a tech aware carrier in MGA and an insure tech. Like if I, you know what I mean? Like I, I look at them and they're working on the same project. In fact, some insure techs that I kind of know the inner workings of have the same tech stack as some major insurance carriers and in MGAs. Like there's really very little difference. And so like, one calls themselves an insure tech and one's too old to get away with calling themselves. <laughs> yeah. an insure tech. And so, but, but they're both very, very tech centered. And so that the industry's responded uh, pretty, pretty forcefully in many cases. Yeah. One other thing I'd, I'd be remiss to not mention is, is CISOs, right. And some of the work that they're doing. And I know a lot of what they do, quite frankly, is probably behind the scenes in terms of, you know, from my business perspective as you know, somebody on the business side, right. So they're, creating, you know, an, an API layer, right. And they're moving to you know, cloud migration. So they're doing a lot of like plumbing basically and work behind the scenes to allow you to innovate that. I think sometimes that work doesn't get fully appreciated. And so um, there is some necessary work. So when the CEO does come, right. The chief underwriter or chief actuary, chief clinical does come, right. It's like, yeah, we can, we can do that. Right. We actually have the capabilities to, to, to do that. So I do think there's definitely some forward looking CISOs that are, had a lot of mindset on, you know, what's the art of the possible. And they've been kind of preparing right all along the organization to, to do that. Um, so yeah. I'm curious, James, like, you know, 2024, right. Let's get the crystal ball out here. So how do you see the industry changing both here in the U S and uh, globally, as you referenced, we've kind of right expanded some of the footprint of you know, guests that we've had on the podcast. Man, I, how do I see the, the entire industry changing? I mean, it's, it's, I, I think that first, uh, funding, uh, impacts everything. Right. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, how many, I think we're going to see quite a few companies that are startups in the insure tech space, not be able to get their next round of funding. And so I think that's gonna We're going to see some acquisitions. We're going to see some shutdowns. Uh, it's going to be a harder time. So if I can just say like in general, I think that's going to impact the insure tech industry because everybody's still riding off of rounds they raised before things got really tight. And unless the VC purse strings loosen up real fast, um, people are going to run out of capital. And so I think you'll see uh, a noticeable number of companies that uh, are forced to sell or go through M&A transactions or shut down. I'm not saying like half of them. I, I think it's a, I think it's less than that, maybe 10%, 20%, but you'll notice. Um, so I think that's going to change things uh, a, a bit, but we're also going to see real production versions like chat GPT five and six, like major production versions roll out. You're going to see Google's competitor and you're going to see Twitter's competitor and you're going to see a bunch of different companies that roll out really good API driven um, large language models and that are really usable. 
So I think that's going to be a major deal too. And I think that it'll be the year of actually being able to start drawing conclusions based on all this data, like give us insights. I think it's, I, I, want, I almost want to call 2024 the year of insights, right? It's going to be a big year of we've been collecting all this data and amassing this pile of data and it's, it's time for insights. So that's my, that's my read on it. And I think, um, you know, 2023, it's a, it was a year of it's a, already a foregone conclusion to migrate to the cloud. Uh, you saw the entire Guidewire customer base say, yep, we're going to cloud. <laughs> yeah. And then, you yeah. know, so like it's that it's now a foregone conclusion. I think, I think next year is the year of insights. And that's really it. That's all we have time for today, Rob, but man, what a great conversation. What a great time spending together. Um, and, uh, it's been an awesome year for InsureTech and the InsureTech Geek podcast. Rob, as always, thank you so much for joining me for this and every conversation that we have. You've been an incredible partner in this podcast and co-host. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it, James. It's always fun to be your co-pilot and be along for the the ride. And a special thanks also to everybody behind the scenes. So you've the team has grown over the years as well in terms of the, the, the behind the scenes folks that help make the magic happen. So a uh, shout out to all of them for their hard work. Really appreciate what everybody does. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll go ahead and name a few of them. Uh, Lucas Lakeen, he's our video guy who's on right now. We've got uh, Pablo Landriel, who's in charge of design and graphics and creative director here at uh, JB Knowledge. We've got the incredible team over at Mic Drop. Uh, they're our, our agency and publicity that does all the booking, and they really focus on uh, bringing people in. If uh, you're other insure techs out there and you need just an outstanding company that does publicity and PR, uh, it's uh, it's Mic Drop out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, Katie Zeppieri is the uh, the boss there, and we, we've just got a really great team that supports us uh, in 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 getting this uh, getting this podcast produced, and we appreciate all of them. So. Uh, Thank you to everybody. And and most importantly, podcast is nothing without its listeners. So thanks to our amazing listeners for tuning in to this and every episode of the InsureTech Geek Podcast. If you enjoyed our discussion and want to dive further into the world of insurance technology, visit us at insuretechgeek.com. Tune in on YouTube, listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We now upload all of our video uh, episodes onto Spotify, which is really cool. That's a new thing as well. Uh, until next time, enjoy the ride. And geek out. This has been the Insure Tech Geek Podcast, powered by JB Knowledge, jbknowledge.com. The Insure Tech Geek Podcast is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. I've been your host, James Benham, that's jamesbenham.com, with co host Rob Galbraith at endofinsurance.com. Thank you for joining us today. Look forward to meeting up again. We're taking you on a journey through Insure Tech, so enjoy the ride and geek out.